Nous avons choisi d'organiser cette audition très en amont des débats qui auront lieu en commission de l'environnement, également en commission marché intérieur, pour nous informer. C'est vraiment tout à fait, j'insiste sur ce point, une discussion informelle des acteurs vraiment en amont de tous les, tous les débats que nous aurons. Antonia Parvanova euh, s'excuse de ne pouvoir être présente et euh, ma collègue Rebecca euh, Taylor, euh, que je suis heureuse de saluer et qui présidera la deuxième partie de cette réunion, nous pensons euh, qu'il euh, est important de connaître ce que les principaux acteurs que vous êtes pensent euh, sur ce projet de révision proposé par la Commission européenne. Alors nous avons donc choisi de mettre autour de la table l'ensemble des acteurs. D'abord la Commission, euh, et qui est représentée par Madame Le Crenier, chef d'unité, et son collaborateur. Les parlementaires, je remercie tout particulièrement euh, Peter Lise, qui est un des deux rapporteurs euh, du Parlement, et je le remercie d'avoir accepté immédiatement cette invitation. Un universitaire qui a beaucoup travaillé sur ce thème, M. Fraser, et qui a fait le déplacement depuis le Pays de Galles. Translation is what? No. C'est pas nécessaire. Donc, en tout cas, merci, M. Fraser, d'être parmi nous. Euh, le, le président du regroupement des fédérations européennes des fabricants de matériel médicaux, M. Bernasconi. La spécialiste du Bureau européen des consommateurs, Mme Passarani et un représentant des organismes notifiés allemands, euh, M. Juncker, qui, je crois, a déjà participé à euh, l'audition du Sénat français et dont l'intervention a été très utile à la réflexion. Alors, euh, nous sommes donc ici pour discuter de tous les sujets, y compris les sujets qui peuvent fâcher, parce qu'il faut discuter de tout. Euh, je pense par exemple à l'opportunité ou non de créer un système d'autorisation de mise sur le marché pour les produits qui sont les plus à risque. Le Parlement s'est prononcé en faveur d'un tel système dans sa résolution à propos de la fraude PIP, euh, sans entrer dans les détails de ce qu'il en, en, euh, convenait de, de mettre en place. Nous n'avons évidemment pas à l'esprit un simple copier-coller de ce qui existe pour les médicaments, et nous savons faire la différence entre l'un et l'autre. Et les caractéristiques des produits sont bien entendu très différents et je pense que c'est un point qui devra être discuté. Voilà, je euh, voudrais simplement dire, avant de vous donner la parole, euh, que cette législation a beaucoup de conséquences sur la santé de nos concitoyens et elle ne peut pas seulement être jugée à l'aune des préoccupations économiques. Nous attendons donc des participants qu'ils nous démontrent si, oui ou non, la proposition de règlement est une réponse opportune, suffisante, au regard des défaillances que, malheureusement, nous avons constatées. Les débats se dérouleront donc en deux temps. Le premier panel sera consacré à l'exposé du projet de la Commission et une réaction par l'un des rapporteurs du Parlement. Chacun dispose de dix minutes. Puis, dans un deuxième temps, le panel fera intervenir les acteurs impliqués. Chacun disposera de 7 minutes, puis nous aurons un débat euh, avec euh, la salle, et c'est ma euh, consoeur, ma collègue, Madame Rebecca Taylor, qui euh, animera la deuxième partie de ces débats. Voilà, donc, sans plus tarder, je vous passe la parole. Merci, Madame Lepage, pour cette introduction. Mesdames et Messieurs, bonjour. Je suis ravie d'être euh, parmi vous pour euh, cette présentation sur la, la révision euh, de la législation sur les dispositifs médicaux, and I will switch into English uh, for this presentation. So let me start first with the current regulatory framework. There are three main directives which cover the broad sector of medical devices. There is an horizontal one which covers medical devices such as implants, X-ray machines, MRI scanners, or simple bandages. There are also two more specific directives, one on active implantable medical devices, such as pacemakers, and one on in vitro diagnostic medical devices, such as blood test, HIV test. So these directives are from the 19th, and except for some amendments, they have remained very stable. Their main objective is to maintain a high level of health protection in a well-functioning internal market. The two aspects are linked, as the proper functioning of the internal market 
implies that the medical devices circulate without restrictions, but also that they ensure a high level of health protection, which means that only the safe medical devices circulate. The strengths of the current system shall be kept in the revision. The strengths are first flexibility to adapt to the needs. As there are more than 500,000 of different products in this sector. Cost effectiveness is also a strength as it allows very rapid access to market of innovative products that are beneficial to patients. SME friendliness is also important since SMEs represent more than 80% of the sector. And finally, support to innovation and competitiveness for the benefit of patients, consumers, healthcare professionals, and industry is also an important factor. Since we have started with this exercise about the revision, we have always said that if we want to keep the regulatory system, we need to reinforce it. Why? The main reasons are the following. First, there is a need to adapt to technological and scientific progress in a sector which knows a very rapid evolution. We have also to address the weaknesses of the system. We have to provide transparency. Now there is a real lack of information about the product which are their characteristics and their clinical evaluation. We need also to ensure a uniform application of the rules in an enlarged internal market. We have to take over international developments and to respond to public expectations. So we have prepared an extensive impact assessment of the situation. And in this uh, report, we have defined all the problems and we have assessed all the possible options. And then the proposal have been adopted in September 2012. There are three texts. Text. There is a communication on safe, effective, and innovative medical devices and in vitro diagnostic medical devices for the benefit of patients, consumer, and healthcare professionals. There is a proposal for a regulation on medical devices and a proposal for a regulation on in vitro diagnostic medical devices. Looking to the future regulatory framework, I, I must say that there are five main aspects which are taken into consideration. The main changes concern the scope, the pre-market obligations, the post-market obligations, transparency, and governance. These are the five main issues. So the first one is the scope. So we will have to extend the scope of the regulatory framework to cover, for example, products which combine a device and a non-viable human tissues or cells. We have also to take into account invasive products for which the manufacturer claims only an aesthetic purpose, but which present the same characteristics and the same risks as medical devices. For example, plano contact lenses, implant for body augmentation, and so on. The reprocessing of single-use devices is also an aspect which should be regulated. Now we have a gray zone about genetic tests, and so there is a need of a clear definition to cover these, text, these tests, and we have also to provide a clear definition of companion diagnostics, which are tests providing information to predict treatment responses or reactions. In-house IVDs should also be brought under the scope of the regulations, but not be subject to all the requirements, as the hospital must continue to be able to make their own test to respond to a health crisis or to diagnose rare diseases. Devices used outside the European Union to provide commercial diagnostic services to a healthcare professional or a patient established in the Union shall comply with the European regulations. 
If we look now to the pre-market phase, there is one issue on which, on, on, which, on which there was a clear consensus in all the consultations. It was the significant differences regarding the designation and monitoring of notified bodies on the one hand, and the quality and depth of conformity assessment performed by them on the other. So the proposals put in place stricter and more detailed minimum legal requirements for designation of notified bodies. Any designation and at regular intervals, the monitoring of these bodies are made subject to joint assessments with experts from other member states and the Commission. Not only the designation of these bodies, but also the way they work should also be improved. So the position of the notified body vis-a-vis -vis manufacturers is strengthened, including their duty to carry unannounced factory inspections and to conduct physical or laboratory tests on devices. The proposal also requires rotation of the notified body's personnel involved in the assessment of devices at appropriate intervals. And the proposal is put in place a scrutiny mechanisms which means that for iris devices, and where necessary for other types of devices, an expert committee will have the power to request the notified body to submit a preliminary assessment on which the committee can issue comments with a, within a deadline of 60 days before the notified body can issue a certificate. So for the competent authorities, it is a second look at individual assessment, and they can make their view heard before a device is placed on the market. Next slide. With clinical evaluation, we cover both pre- and post-market phases. Indeed, we have supplemented the existing rules to clarify the clinical data to be submitted for pre-market assessment and what manufacturers must do to conduct post-market clinical follow-up. Moreover, for clinical investigations, we move from the manufacturer concept to the sponsor concept, and in case of multi-center investigations in more than one member state, one member state will coordinate the work. Looking now to the post-market phase, we have strengthened the rule concerning vigilance and market surveillance. It was clear through the PIP case that the analysis of incident led to the detection of the fraud, but it took a too long time. Therefore, we propose a central reporting of serious incident and field safety corrective actions in a European database, a coordinated analysis of serious incidents affecting the safety of patients in more than one member state, and an enhanced involvement of healthcare professionals and patients to report serious incidents. The fourth issue concerns transparency. The following aspects shall contribute to enhance this transparency. First, we will have a central database, UDAMET, for the registration of medical devices on the European market and the relevant economic operators. There will be a public access to some part of UDAMET. For implantable and class three medical devices, a summary of safety and performance will be made public, and we will put in place traceability requirements to be implemented gradually in a proportionate, in a, in a way proportionate to the, the risk through a European UDI system which will be inter internationally compatible and used all along the supply chain. Another aspect of this transparency will be the implant card, which will be given to all the patients which will be implanted with information about uh, the, re the relevant devices. The last point concerns the governance. A medical device coordination group will be created composed of members representing national competent authorities to ensure better coordination between member states 
with the Commission providing the scientific, technical, and logistic support. This is an important aspect which is lacking now, and there will be, there will be also an important informatic infrastructure put in place. The Commission shall also ensure the sharing of expertise between the Member States in the different fields of product in order to determine the regulatory status of product. This is very important due to the high number of borderline products. The last point I would like to mention concerning the governance is the importance to have access to a clinical or scientific expertise. And an access to this expertise will be provided to, through the European reference laboratories, which will provide scientific and technical assistance to competent authorities, the Commission, and the notified bodies. These include advice regarding the state of the art and the development of appropriate testing and analysis methods, and their role will be even more important in the field of the IVDs, where they will have to intervene in the conformity assessment for high-risk devices. This is what I wanted to explain to you about this revision, and I will be pleased to answer your question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your speak. Uh, it was very interesting, and you opened a lot of area and uh, uh, possibility of discussion. These two pieces of legislation, the medical devices and the in vitro diagnostic medical devices, is desperately needed. They are desperately needed. We have many problems with the existing legislation, and I would first uh, speak a little bit about the medical devices di uh, directive, or now it will become a regulation. Even though I'm not directly responsible, we have uh, a very qualified shadow rapporteur in the EPP group, Merit McGuinness. She's also here and may intervene later. So I will work very intensively with her, but we share uh, our view in the EPP on this position. And um, that's why I will also say some sentences about this. That we have to act is uh, very evident. You know, in Germany yesterday, a court case started. A woman that has been suffering from this uh, defect, breast implants by the uh, company PIP, went to court in Germany and wants to sue somebody. But the first assessment of the judge is that there is nobody really they can sue. And that is an indication for me that the existing legislation is really weak. So when such a scandal happens and the woman that is affected cannot uh, hold anyone responsible, there is a point and we need to make the legislation much more strict. Um, we have also had this uh, scandal are the hip implants that uh, some journalists tried to get approval, notification for a hip implant. And even though uh, it was obvious that, that they didn't have, they got the approval. Also there, we definitely need to work. And I think the most important lesson to learn from the PIP sc scandal is that we need spot checking in the field. Not only pre-approval, but also after approval. And the notified bodies should not check only the papers. They should look at the product, if the product is really um, delivering the standard that is required. Um, this was an issue that we united from the European Parliament, requested from the Commission. We did our resolution on PIP and asked the Commission to do this, and they did. And I applaud the Commission to introduce this in the uh, proposal. We need a register and we need traceability. Commissioner Dali said when the scandal came up, he visited Denmark, and there is a clinic in Denmark where they used PIP implants, among others, from other companies that had not this problem. 
and they found out um, that 40 women have been implanted with the PIP um, implants, but the clinic was bankrupt and there were no papers left. So thousands of women that had undergone this treatment in the clinic were afraid and didn't know what happened because there was no traceability and there was no register. This needs to change. We addressed it in our resolution and the Commission included it in the draft proposal and I also welcome this very much. The case with uh, hip implants shows that we need also to invest in much better surveillance of the notified bodies. And also this is in the Commission proposal. And I think this is also a reason why the Commission proposal is so big. It has so many pages, including the annexes, it's almost 200 pages. And the wording seems to be quite bureaucratic, because it is a regulation, and the Commission prescribes very much in detail how we can assure that the rules are really accepted. This is heavy stuff for us, that we need to read it. But I don't think there is an alternative. If we are awake in this kind of legislation, we can't be sure that it's implemented. The current situation gives more flexibility to the member states. It's a directive, it's only very broad, but it doesn't work. So that's why we are in favor of a regulation and we are in favor of much more precise wording um, as proposed by the Commission. Now, the big issue inside Parliament and outside Parliament is do we need pre-market authorization for medical devices by the state? And the position of the EPP, and I think it's also a position of, of many colleagues from Alder Group, is no. Um, first of all, we wouldn't have avoided the PIP scandal with a pre-market authorization by the state. There was a fraud and the company changed the composition of the implants after approval. So any measure before the approval would not have addressed this problem. Um, and also, I think we need to act quickly. And when you see how many people work in the notified bodies all over Europe, is it really a realistic scenario to transmit them to state authorities during the next few uh, years and integrate them in a state market uh, surveillance authority? I doubt that this is possible and it raises many questions if all these people are ready, if you find enough qualified people when they don't want to lose uh, their job in the, in the notified body. So it's a big challenge. And that's why I think the um, approach of the Commission to base on the current system, but to very much improve it, is a very intelligent proposal. You know, we are open for discussions, of course. Uh, there was a tight vote in the Parliament, seven votes majority in the plenary in the House for a pre-market approval in specific cases, so we need to discuss it. But that's our position for the moment. Also, because we cannot imagine how the innovation circle in the medical devices can be addressed by a state authority at least during the next five or ten years unless they really uh, employ much more people. So I come now to the report where I'm responsible as a rapporteur, in vitro diagnostic medical devices. I think there are similar questions um, like in the medical devices uh, which are not uh, in vitro diagnostics. But there are also additional challenges. One of the challenges has been mentioned by the Commission. We didn't have a proper legislative framework for DNA testing. And I think that's uh, really important. These are highly sensitive data and the consumer needs to have trust, to be able to have trust that really the test delivers what it claims to deliver. Um, I, from the structure, I also welcome the proposal of the European Commission, but I think I'm obliged to raise some additional points, also based on the Parliament's position 
on specific issues uh, which we adopted in the past years. And I think the main point is to give even more emphasis on the principle of informed consent. Informed consent is a principle raised in the Charter of Fundamental Rights. And informed consent is in danger when we don't deal properly with diagnosis in the area of sensitive uh, health data. For example, HIV is, of course, a very sensitive data. And we need to be absolutely sure that people who undergo an HIV test know what are the consequences and that no third person is able to do an HIV test for, for somebody else. You know, it's private data and uh, it is, uh, I think, uh, dangerous when somebody else thinks I want to investigate if my partner or who else is suffering from HIV. The same applies to genetic testing. I very much welcome the proposal to include genetic testing much more comprehensive in the European legislative framework. But also here we have the question, how can we avoid that third persons uh, make use of data? No, not even the partner, the spouse, but the employer or somebody else who, um, it, it must be absolutely sure that when somebody wants to get genetic information, that's its own genetic information, or when somebody else asks for it, it must be with informed consent. The Parliament's position on this question was always very clear. Uh, we have um, uh, adopted resolutions on this, and we specifically asked for genetic counseling um, when somebody undergoes a genetic test, because they have enormous consequences. You know, for example, there exist uh, diseases like Huntington's chorea. It's a very severe disease, but it only occurs at the age of 50, more or less, between 40 and 60. And it, it is not, uh, nobody can cure it all over the world. So if you get this information, this has consequences not only for you, but for your whole family, because it's a genetic disease. And it's important that people are properly informed what is the consequences when they know it. There's also the right not to know, also for the relatives. And this needs to be addressed in, a, in an intelligent way. We have asked legal advice if we can do this in the proposed directive, and the answer is yes. It will not be easy, it will not be uncontroversial, but legally it's possible and it's based on the Parliament's position that we adopted. And I'm very happy that many actors from civil society support the approach that genetic counselling needs to be enforced. For example, uh, the consumers, which from uh, United Kingdom has made this proposal in the name of BOIC, the European Consumer Organization. Even industry um, is in favour because uh, they want that their products are used in a proper way and not abused and that free riders don't undermine the credibility of the industry. And the medical experts, the European Society for Human Genetics also insist that we need to do something. Before I come to the end, I want to thank uh, Corinne Lepage as well as all the other colleagues from the ALDE group for the good cooperation in the ENVI committee. Explicitly, I would like to mention Chris Davis. And I would also encourage us to cooperate in a positive manner on um, challenges that we have ahead of us. You know, I have understood um, that uh, for the appointment of the new health commissioner, who, who will be, as I hope, responsible for this piece of legislation, there are some discussions inside the ALDE group. But um, as far as I understood, there is a positive assessment from all the three uh, committees that have been involved. And personally, um, when I look at some arguments that are raised against the commissioner-designate, I think um, we need to look at the facts. You know, for example, um, we have uh, a law in Germany which is uh, of course, supported by the Liberals in Germany, that we have a, a registered partnership between homosexual couples that uh, nobody, as far as I understood, in the government, in our coalition with the Liberals, questions. 
And that is exactly what the designate commissioner introduced in Malta. It doesn't exist in many other member states. And uh, that's why I don't think one can just say, oh, he has strange positions on hom homosexuality. What he did is really in line with the policy that Christian Democrats and liberals uh, have in, in many countries. And the same applies for reproductive medicine and other issues. And now there is the argument of the non um, anti-discrimination uh, directive. No, we all are against, anti, uh, against discrimination. But also the German government, including the older part of the government, is against this directive. So if you attack the commissioner, you attack uh, the chairman of the Liberal Party in Germany too. So please, let's work on this issue in the same way um, as we do in other issues. And I'm confident that we find a solution. Thank you. If, thank you, Peter. Thank you for this very clear presentation. I'm not sure that this is really the right place to discuss the quality and the competence of our Commissioner Delegate. Uh, I'm more prise de position. Mais c'est un débat que, que nous avons et que nous aurons dans dans d'autres lieux. Et voyez-vous le Je pense que c'est le propre précisément d'avoir de manière très sereine ce type de ce type de débat. Voilà. Donc je, je, je vous remercie et je passe la parole à la salle pour une salve de questions en direction du représentant de la commission et de mon collègue Peter Lise qui souhaite commencer. Oui. Madame McGuinness. Now, can you hear me at this point? Uh, I, I'm doing it. I don't know. Okay, so this has got it. Okay. Uh, Est-ce que vous avez des questions à poser? Do you have quick questions to ask? Quite well, the comments in relation to what we're trying to do with this legislation, and I think there are several players, and perhaps the medical profession is an area where we need to have a little bit more thought because we have the consumer, which is the patient, and, and no one, I think, and I have family members who have had hip replacements, etc. we never question the quality. We presume quality, and this is how it should be. We are trying to legislate to make sure that that is uh, the way it will be for the future. But we also have a link between the patient and the industry, and that is the medical profession. And I suppose my question to the Commission is, uh, does this regulation improve or assist the patient in understanding the relationship uh, of all players? And how could we ensure that the medical profession are better informed about products and about issues around safety and et sur les euh, éventuels problèmes problèmes de sécurité et de respect des normes parce qu'il me semble euh, que nous the issue of the notified bodies has been well covered by Peter and the commission um, but we really do need to talk about this very deeply when we talk as the regulation does about competence you know what we need to specify what this means um, I, I always worry uh, when there is a financial relationship, and we need to make sure that the financial relationship um, protects the patient um, rather than the industry, while acknowledging um, one very key issue, that the lives of patients across Europe have been hugely improved by innovation in the medical devices sector. It's been quite extraordinary. Um, it is almost uh, that you are not part of the club if you don't have a stent, for example, in your heart, because so many people now do, and it, it, it avoids health problems. So uh, I am so much on the side of making sure that innovation is allowed to flourish, but that we also have protections um, so that patients have full confidence. My last comment is this. I think we need to be careful um, not to try and legislate uh, away criminal activity because crimes are crimes. And with the best will in the world, this regulation uh, cannot stop criminal activity. We need to have a better system that uh, finds 
criminal uh, activity in this sector where it arises and finds it rapidly. Uh, so that is the case of uh, on-the-spot checks, regular monitoring. Um, but I would like you to address the issue of the medical profession because I think they play a key role in all of this. Thank you. Peter, do you want to answer? What's the question for the commission? Oui, euh, je vous remercie pour euh, cette euh, question qui, qui en contient en fait un certain, un certain nombre. Donc, je commencerai peut-être dans la chaîne par le, le patient, parce que pour nous, c'est l'élément euh, fondamental. Tout... Of course, the most fundamental question. Uh, the legislation targets giving the patient sure and innovative products at an affordable price. This is the kind of balance that we're trying to find in our proposals. Safety, innovation and cost. We're really looking for reasonable solutions. One very important aspect for the patient, of course, informing him. And here too, we're trying to find a whole series of elements uh, that we can inform the patient better than, than the kind of information he's getting today. So we'll have a database. Uh, what, so there you can see what instruments are on the market, what devices are there, uh, what are their characteristics. There'll be a summary uh, for the, the risks of performance and the very, various features of the product. We've also considered that uh, given the PIP problem, we, it's tr obviously uh, we need a data sheet for every product that explains to the patient uh, uh, exactly what the features are, and, and they give a certain amount of information and the kind of, of follow-up that he's got to uh, organize. So it's there, there, and, and other types of uh, devices that they, might, that, that they might use as well, uh, whether it's dangerous to use them with scanners and so forth. And this is, absolute, this is absolutely fundamental. And uh, records are absolutely crucial now. We saw this in PIP because we don't have a register of where all these, these implants were used. And, and we need one. We need to know where they are. Everything that's a post-market assessment, uh, both uh, by the, uh, the authorities and the medical profession, is something that must be reinforced. And so it's not just a pre-market authorization. We need monitoring. We need a follow-up. And now we are discussing with the healthcare professionals so that we can review a product if it's needed or take it off the market. And, and patients here, too, should have this information available to them. Now, reporting incidents. This is another important aspect that concerns not only manufacturers, but this will also encourage patients and healthcare professionals to report any incidents. And the member, sta the member states should see that this works. Uh, but we sh should have a second channel of information via healthcare professionals and patients as well as via the authorities. And we, we will be trying to uh, monitor any incidents that, that might occur during the shelf life of the product. Because it's important not just to describe the product, but to re reinforce uh, the instructions for use. We've seen that any number of incidents are not necessarily associated with the product itself, but because the instructions for use were not sufficiently clear. So this, this, these are roughly the kinds of elements we have in mind. Thank you very much. I think it is true, very important to emphasize, as you and Peter have both done, that PIP is, is in fact, a crime. It's a fraud. Uh, and uh, one cannot foresee 
and one cannot write a legislation uh, that it goes that can prevent any kind of fraud, but we can try to control it. Now, before you ask your question, could you please introduce yourself? Since in Europe Forum, this is a coalition from patient victims, uh, health professionals, uh, insurers, um, and family organization. Um, I have a question for Mrs. Uh, Le Crenier. Um, do you think that a high-risk medical device needs to be effective? Uh, as, as the question is the word efficacy, because in the Commission proposal, you use the word performance, and I wonder why there is no use of efficacy, because a medicine that you take and can stop taking needs to be effective, and an implant that you have in your body and that you cannot remove only needs to be performant, and efficacy and performance are not the same. Just to quote something from the BMG, if a manufacturer wishes to market a laser to incise her tissues to treat arrhythmia in the EU, the manufacturer must show that the laser incises her tissue only. In the US, however, the manufacturers must show that the laser incises her tissue and also treats the arrhythmia. Thank you. For that question, I think that we need to make a distinction between two different situations. Now, a device must be reliable and it must ensure performance. It must it must live up to the performance it announces. It must correspond to the performance that have been announced. And, of course, there must be an assessment before it's put on the market and that there is a risk-benefit analysis that's done here. Uh, oh, the, and legislation requires uh, that this risk-benefit analysis is accompanied with a high level of protection. So there's several different aspects that are, in fact, insured in the annex. But as concerns the idea of safety and performance, now, that, now there's, there's another concept which is comparing various medical devices. And here we have a question of reimbursement of these devices. So access to the market is one thing. We cannot impose that, that only the, the uh, top level devices can be put on the market because some people simply can't afford them or might not actually need that kind of quality. Uh, it's, it's kind of as if we, were, we, we said you could only sell luxury cards, but on the other hand, as it comes to reimbursements, uh, each country uh, is, is going to decide what products are going to be reimbursed and how much. And there, uh, they could also maybe be comparing, uh, say, say a medicinal drug to a medical device as well. So these are two different problems. Access to the market is insured for reliable products that live up to the performances that they announce, and then the comparison uh, between uh, various products. This is something that is much closer to question of reimbursement. Are there other questions? Pas d'autres questions. No other questions? Si. Oui. Uh, my name is Shanta Singh. I'm a, a lawyer and I'm representing some women in the Netherlands uh, that uh, suffered from the PIP breast implants. And in my opinion, it's not only a problem of the, of, the, of the PIP manufacturer, but also of the member states, because I found out that there are several uh, yeah, complaints about the breast implants already to the, to the competent authority in the Netherlands, and I found out also that it was the, the case in England. So I don't think that you can only say that there was fraud of the manufacturer, but there's also some, you know, some negligence also from the member states to do something with, uh, with, with, with complaints of patients and also physicians. So therefore I want to maybe to raise the question if this proposal covers that problem, that the, the competent authorities in the member states have no incentive 
to, uh, to really take serious uh, claims or complaints from physicians and uh, also from patients. The Commission can, um, of course, answer in much more detail, but you now when you read the proposal, it's extremely precise on what the Member States needs to do when there is a problem. The, the companies are obliged, the notified bodies are obliged to um, alert immediately the competent authority. The competent authority is obliged to immediately inform the other member states and the commission. And then there is a specific committee uh, under the directive, the medical device committee, I think is the name, where all the complaints are assessed. So I think the problem is that we didn't have this in the past, but when this is implemented, we, we will be much more safe. So 100% guarantee is never possible, but I think there are many provisions in the proposal that also address this problem. There is an obligation, and there is not only an obligation to intervene somehow, but it's an obligation to communicate also between the 27 member states and with the Commission. Yeah, very quickly. Proposal which should improve uh, this type of uh, situation. The first one is the reporting from the patients because this was lacking. Or the patients reported only to the manufacturer and the, the, the complaints were not transmitted to the national uh, authority. So this is one point. Second point is that there will be a cooperation and a coordination between the member states. Be because now it's very difficult when you have a small market to see all the implications of some incidents. So it's better to have a, a much broader uh, <coughs> space to and a higher number of uh, reporting to exactly uh, have a clear to have a clear picture of the of the situation. So this is uh, the, the second aspect. And the third one is that we have provision in the text about the trends, so the obligation for the manufacturer to report not only what is considered as a serious incident, but also the trends of incidents which in itself are not so serious, but which demonstrate that there is a problem compared with the unknown performance of the, of the product. And this is precisely what allows the French authorities to, to detect the problem. It was a trend in the, in the incident due to the, the PIP implants. So these three aspects combined together will, we hope, uh, improve the, the situation. And I can also invite you to read uh, the last annexes of the impact assessment where you can find the analysis of all the aspects of the, the PIP case. We made a stress test, so we analyze all the, the, the problems, the deficiencies which happen in this, uh, in this issue concerning the PIP case. So it's an annex, it's the, I think, appendix, appendix 11 of the impact assessment. So you will have the chronology of the fact and the deficiencies which have been uh, noted. Je, je vous remercie. Il n'y a plus de questions. I want to thank you. Were there any more questions? Uh, yes, there is one here. Could you? Uh, Pierre Sula from... Question for uh, Mr. Lise um, and Ms. Lepage, um, I was interesting when you when you were saying uh, you believe there is no need for uh, um, for PMA, um, and and some of the reason I, I believe you said is we wouldn't have stopped PIP, uh, PIP, and and it would have um, there would be a problem sort of moving around all the personnel from member states to a, some central level. Um, I, w I was wondering what is what is your view instead on the on the scrutiny mechanism, um, and how do you think this would perform as compared to uh, to PMA in, st in, in terms of preventing um, issues like PIP or instead of, uh, or in terms of uh, just eff being efficient on, on some of these issues. Thank you. Yeah, I welcome this scrutiny mechanism because it is a kind of safeguard when the notified bodies or even some competent authorities in the member states don't do what they should do under the regulation, there is a mechanism to intervene for, so to say, the European area. And I think this is, given the complexity of 
of the problem. We have thousands of medical devices approved every year, much more than drugs. This is uh, the right approach because you reassure that really all the member states fulfill their duty. Also problems like with the hip implant can be avoided because uh, it's much more strict control over the notified bodies and then the authorities that supervise the notified bodies. Uh, we can discuss about the details, but I would also encourage industry who has certain reservations on this scrutiny um, to have an open mind because I think uh, we need to very clearly communicate that we have understood the problem and that we are willing to react. And, and just to say everything is fine is not possible after all was what happened. To answer your question, uh, that's not quite what I was saying. Uh, I said that we mustn't we, we, we must keep in mind that PIP is a question of fraud. So I'm a little bit confused. Initially, I was fairly favorable to an a priori system, uh, one, one that's a bit more flexible than a pre-market authorization. Uh, but I really think we need a, a cost-benefits approach. What is going to work? Best, what is going to be the most effective in the current economic context and to protect health of patients. So my position, I think, is, is, is really based on that idea, but I haven't got any firm position. I'm really looking at what's going to be best. Now, of course, what's more, when we talk about controls, we, uh, we've, got to be, we've got to have the resources and the facilities to carry out those controls, and today that is not always the case. Now, if, if, if you look at the Health Environment Committee, uh, often we're overly optimistic about the quality of controls that we actually carry out. So I think the economic problems that we're having in all of the states of the Union at this point uh, are not going to make that easier. So I think we need to take account of real life if you'll excuse the expression, because it's fine to have a system of controls, but if you have nobody who can do them, uh, then we're not making any progress. So I, I, I don't have a religious attitude on any of this. Uh, I think we really need to, th to, to think about what's actually working. And uh, I would like to suggest going on to the next panel, if Mrs. Taylor would come and take my seat. Thank you. I will now begin the second part of the seminar. Um, here we will have the opportunity to hear from different stakeholders, um, from clinicians, representatives of the medical device industry, the notified bodies, and of consumers. Each of our speakers will have seven minutes to um, give their point of view and explain um, their position. We begin with Dr. Alan Fraser, who is a reader in cardiology from the Welsh Heart Research Institute in the University of Cardiff. Thank you, Dr. Fraser. Uh, thank you to Madame Lepage and to yourself and colleagues in all day for the invitation to give a clinical perspective to this meeting, which I think is very important. And uh, the European Society of Cardiology, which I'm also representing, has been doing this over the last couple of years with the preparatory process for this recast. We've appreciated the opportunity to provide a clinical opinion. Uh, we would welcome much more clinical involvement in these debates if it was possible. Um, I will remind us why this is part of the competence of the European Union. If we look back to Maastricht and you look at the last of these items, the community shall uh, maintain contribution to the attainment of a high level of health protection. 
Um, and so this is part of uh, EU affairs. But you will appreciate that the way that we do this in the European Union for pharmaceutical products and for medical devices is very different. Um, as we've heard in the discussion after the previous panel, the key requirement for approval of new drugs in Europe is clinical efficacy. We only allow onto the market drugs that have been through formal clinical trials and have been proven to work and to produce a better endpoint, a better clinical outcome. Whereas um, with devices, there has been a traditional difference, which I think is maintained in the recast, which is that the manufacturer, through the approval process with the notified bodies, needs to demonstrate satisfactory performance. It is for the manufacturer to define what that performance is and for it to satisfy the notified body whether or not that has been met. But there is no requirement for a set level of clinical evaluation of efficacy for all new products, including new class three implantable um, medical devices. Of course, there is a requirement for clinical evaluation, but that doesn't always uh, define or include clinical efficacy, which we think should be important in more cases than at present. Um, as I've said, uh, I am also a member of the European Society of Cardiology, which you may have seen from the first slide, covers a very wide territory uh, throughout the European Union and a further afield. And last year, we had a policy conference at the beginning of the year reviewing in great detail the impact of medical devices within cardiology, which is huge and beneficial, but also drawing together evidence of examples where patients in Europe have uh, suffered complications that we in some way could attribute or analyze in terms of how the uh, legislation was working and how the approval processes impacted and what was available for patients. And I refer you to this document in detail and would be happy to send you that analysis if you want more specific information or examples. But I'd like to um, highlight the evaluation that we made ourselves trying to understand the system at present. As you know, it's based on the manufacturer approaching a notified body. And that system was set up as the new approach for conformance with European Union directives in general. It was never designed specifically for medical devices. It became used for it because it was the general uh, method of conformity assessment within the European Union. The notified bodies are controlled by the competent authorities on the basis of subsidiarity. They are at the national level responsible and there is an issue of coordination which is partly addressed in the recast um, but the uh, European Commission role has always been supervisory and it has been the responsibility of the notified bodies to conduct the evaluation and to give the manufacturer permission to display a CE mark on its product and to market it. The system relies on advisory documents as standards against which manufacturers can prepare their dossiers of evidence and on which the notified bodies can judge whether or not the devices conform. And these come, for example, from the ISO, from SEN, Senelec, and other organizations. And there is an issue of clinical and professional and scientific expert involvement in these committees, because they're very often largely constituted by members of industry representatives of the research and development departments of companies. And the, please keep clicking. I'm sorry, it's difficult at remote control. <clears throat> the manufacturers therefore have a major input in advice and there has been a gap in the past with insufficient medical input and professional and scientific and technical expert advice from universities and professional associations to this whole process and I'll return to that briefly. Um, next, the other key aspect of this is that it's for the manufacturer to propose a system for post-marketing surveillance. And we recognize in Europe that for the benefit of innovatory products where there really is an unmet clinical need, getting early access to new effective devices that has to be balanced by increased um, surveillance after devices are put on the market. At the moment, that is the responsibility of the manufacturer to propose, and I'll come back to that very briefly. Next, please. 
So in summary, the views of uh, the European cardiologists are that the priority should be for clinical safety. We do need more extensive pre-market testing of certain classes of devices. We do need transparency. There should be much more information available about the whole process than in the past. For example, there has been no list of medical devices to consult as a clinician in Europe. There has been no way that a clinical doctor in the past could get access to the evaluation of a device. Please go back. I'm sorry, I can't see the slides either. <laughs> um, no, please go back. Uh, we also think there should be more evaluation of clinical studies before approval and less reliance on equivalence. And we want to strengthen post-market surveillance. Please go on. So for transparency, if we believe, as we all do now, in rational evidence-based medicine, you can make an argument, as we did, that these are the requirements that clinical doctors should know about their devices before they use them, as we would with choices of drugs that we give our patients. So not just what class a device falls into, but also the standards which the notified bodies are using to judge whether or not the devices are satisfactory. We should see the information that the manufacturers submit and we should see the results of the evaluation so that we can compare one device against another when we're making choices about what devices to recommend to purchasers, what devices we want to use clinically. And of course, as the directives suggest, as the proposal suggests, there should be more um, clinical uh, access to the outcomes of field safety corrective actions and reports of device failures, and that is proposed. It is also proposed that the new Udemed database will be in the public domain, and we uh, strongly uh, endorse that. And there will be a database of trials, so that is progress. But what I think is not yet clear is whether or not we will get sufficient access to enough detailed information, and we believe that the legislation could be more clear about these requirements. I quote from one clause in the new draft directive, which is that in the case of class three devices, those are high risk implantable devices, the manufacturer should draw up a summary of safety and clinical performance. Now this is not the data, this is a summary, and this is what the, device, the, the legislation proposes. I believe that we should have access, as is now planned with therapeutic trials of drugs to the results of the trial and the data of the trial should be open to public scrutiny and academic review. So we think we should go beyond what is in the legislation um, and that seems very reasonable to any clinician and indeed to patients to have confidence in the recommendations of their physicians for which device they should use. Uh, I've mentioned the need for scientific advice and we do approve of the reference laboratory concept which is mentioned, but it's not clear to us from the draft directives how uh, academic, professional, scientific societies and clinical associations, of which there are very many in Europe, for example, from orthopedic surgery, with the problems with um, metal on metal hips, from cardiology, from all sorts of other specialties. It's not clear to us what our role will be because what we argued for and what I think should be spelled out is that there need to be professional advisory committees for particular classes of high-risk devices. As is standard in other jurisdictions elsewhere in the world, that if a new high-risk device or a new concept is proposed, there should be a group of experts who can um, read the evidence and make appropriate recommendations to the competent authorities. Um, this is not clarified in the current proposals and we think this is extremely important. And then lastly, let me choose one further example and this relates to post-marketing surveillance. Uh, this particular paragraph states that the manufacturer shall institute a system of post-marketing surveillance. Now, we strongly support the concept that um, we want to be able to have innovative products and work with industry to develop those for European patients. 
but we must balance that with very rigorous systems so that if there are unexpected or unforeseen or unpredictable problems with devices, the problems are picked up early and in a systematic way. And we believe strongly that this should be done by independent bodies, not by the manufacturers. The manufacturers have a responsibility to pros propose this system, which is excellent, and for it to be approved. But we think the organization of registries and post-marketing surveillance and the scrutiny of data should be done independently, whether by research organizations or professional societies. But there are many excellent examples. Now, this may be different for different types of devices, but for particularly for high-risk devices, um, we think there should be some means of looking at who controls the data and who manages this process that perhaps needs further scrutiny. So I hope I've not taken up too much of my time and I've just concentrated on a few brief comments. But in summary, we welcome many of the proposals. In some respects, we'd like them to be more clear and more exact, particularly relating to clinical safety, to the amount of information that is made available in the public domain on which we can judge whether the European system is really satisfactory, on the involvement of academic experts in setting standards against which devices should be approved, and on the independent control of post-marketing surveillance. And we would welcome the opportunity to work with any colleagues in the European Parliament if you wish to approach us either myself here as the co-chair of our task force on devices, or Sophie O'Kelly, who's a colleague from the European Heart House, who's here from our European Affairs Department. And if you approach us, we'd be pleased to, to help. Thank you again for the invitation and for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Fraser. I will now pass the floor to Serge Bernasconi, who is CEO of MedTech Europe, the Alliance of UCAMED, and EDMA, the Medical Device Industry Associations. Thank you, Mr. Bernasconi. <coughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting the industry to this, uh, to this discussion. Um, I want to uh, make sure that uh, uh, we understand that we strongly support that the uh, current system can and should be improved just as an initial statement. Uh, everybody in this room is fully aware of this uh, unfortunate PIP scandal. I think we've talked a lot about it in the last uh, 60 minutes. And I want to be very clear about it. As it has been said, uh, this is a fraud. This was totally illegal. However, we also have to consider that it harmed patients and it also harmed industry. And we want to make sure that whatever system is being designed or proposed will prevent this to happen again. We also want to ensure that this revision doesn't make it harder for patients to have access to the latest life-saving innovation. Uh, I think it's Mrs. McGuinness uh, indicated that many people, many patients today actually benefit greatly of you know, the medical devices. I think as, as a bit of statistics, there's about 500,000 devices being used in Europe. This is a couple of millions of patients which benefit from medical devices, be either saving life or significantly improving their current situation. And we should not forget this. Now, we have looked at the commission proposal and we certainly would support many measures suggested by this proposal. But before we go into the detail, let's make sure that we are all on the same page about medical device sector and how it is regulated today. So maybe next slide. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's an extremely wide and large domain. Uh, it goes from, from basic pansement or uh, surgical material to very innovative prothesis, to MRI, to implanted devices, to mechanical beds. So extremely, extremely wide. And as I mentioned, with about over 500,000 different devices uh, currently available for patients. Now, next thing. It also is, an <coughs> is a domain 
which is due to grow significantly in the years to come. We have to get used that devices will be becoming part uh, on everyday healthcare systems and healthcare solution for patients and significantly solution for patient as we grow older. Consequently, yes, we have to look very closely at the system. Yes, we have to look at the fact that it is regulated in the correct way with in mind some key criteria. And I'd like to go to maybe the next slide. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> the first one, obviously, and I think that we shall never forget this, is for us patient safety. Uh, patient safety is critical, and among things, obviously, PIP situation should never happen again. Okay, but we had to be able to provide patient safety as well as efficacious and proven efficacious product that significantly improve patients' life. But we also have to make sure that we have uh, devices which basically uh, patient can benefit from, but also healthcare systems. Next slide, please. Now, what do we expect as an industry? I think the first point is what we would like is to make sure that what is already been put forward, uh, in particular as a result of the unfortunate happenings in the industry, be implemented. That would be the first point. Second is that we would like <coughs> that we set up a system which provide, and I'm going to make sure that I'm online with a safety and clear, high standards, predictable system. We need to restore, and we're aware of this, the trust in the system for patients. We need to restore the trust in the system for all the stakeholders involved with this industry. We need to make sure that we provide and we make available safe products with the latest innovative technology for patients. And we need to make sure that the system we have also allows healthcare system to have access to this type of innovation, because these can contribute significantly to many of the challenges that healthcare systems are facing today. Next slide. Now, <clears throat> what we believe is if we look at uh, the, the proposal and the way we have looked at it as an industry is are based on three major criteria. Is for one, first of all, is, is the proposal or is the different aspect of the proposal providing a safer environment for patients. That's point number one. Point number two is, is the proposal basically allowing access to innovation for patients? And the last point is, is that proposal making sure that we can continue to provide innovation and R&D as it should be coming because of what's up in the pipeline of this industry and that contributes to help healthcare system. Point in. Now, I won't go through all of these, but these are some of the subject that, uh, or some of the proposal that as an industry, we strongly support. Yes, we support a stronger uh, regulation over notified bodies. Yes, we support stronger post-marketing surveillance studies. Yes, we support better way of tracing products. Yes, we support better market surveillance and being able to share throughout all the community in Europe issues with products. Yes, we support also stronger clinical requirements. This is all critical for us because it is key if we want to continue to provide devices, as we said, safe, efficacious, and that can really help patients out as well as systems out. However, if we go to the next slide, 
Sorry, we, we do agree, and we are not, yes, in favor of a PMA centralized system. We support the notified body system. However, we strongly support that that notified body system be stronger, better control, higher in standards, because it is crucial that we restore that credibility to the system to patients, to physicians, and to outside stakeholders. We do not favor a centralized PMA system, as we significantly wonder how a centralized PMA type system could handle the speed at which this industry is developing, the speed at which this industry is providing innovation. There is about 500 new class three products going through the system every year. All of these, most of them are critical for patients. How do we set up a system that could guarantee that we do not slow down that access for patients? We also have looked at the various systems which are available around, which are centralized, be it the pharma type system, be it the FDA type system, and we don't see in any of these two better, stronger, safer options for patients than the one we have today. We see delays of system, we see delays of access of innovation for patients. Yes, that we do. Now, again, we saying this are strongly in support of better, stronger control of uh, notified bodies. We agree with the Commission proposal on unexpected uh, visits, totally. We agree on the way accreditation should be given, given to, um, to notified bodies. We agree, and one should also keep in mind a bit of statistics here again, that about 80% of all the dossiers, of all the product filed, are handled by barely 20% of the notified bodies in Europe. So it's about 16 to 20 notified bodies are actually addressing 80% of the dossiers. I think that's an interesting- Could you bring your remarks to a conclusion? So yes, that's an interesting that. point that we would like to, to, to bring forward because I think there is an option of working on maybe something called center of excellence, which could help maybe the system. So we, we agree with most of the things. We want stronger. The only thing we don't agree with, because there is something we don't agree with the proposal, is basically the scrutiny process put in place. We don't see that as being uh, an option that brings safer solutions for patients. We see that as essentially slowing down access for patients to innovation. However, we don't disagree that alternative solution could be looked into and brought forward to again guarantee high standard and high solution. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bernasconi. I will now pass the floor to Ilaria Passarani, Health Policy Senior Officer for BEOC, the European Consumers Organization. So thank you, Mrs. Passarani. Thank you and good afternoon, everybody. Increasingly, sophisticated devices uh, extend and improve the daily life of millions of European consumers. But um, devices' malfunctions have become what some people have called a modern disease that uh, will continue to occur. And that's why, from our perspective, the revision of the EU legislation is a unique opportunity to increase consumer protection, to uh, reduce risks, and also to avoid uh, costly recalls. I've been invited uh, in this seminar to bring uh, the voice of consumers, and so I did. And if you can help me with this, uh, I, instead of me speaking, I'd like, I to, I'd like to um, invite you to listen to the story of Emilia, a patient with an implanted medical device. It's uh, Spanish. Me, me decidí operarme después de mucho pensármelo porque yo soy muy miedosa, ¿eh? uh -huh. pero era tal el complejo que cogí que decidí hacerlo. 
Se suponía que era un implante que iba a durar toda la vida. No te informan para nada. No les conviene informarte. Yo nunca he estado bien después de operarme. Nunca. Yo iba allí, a mi médico, a mi cirujano, le decía que me encontraba muy mal, que el pecho derecho me dolía, me ardía, estaba caliente, estaba duro, había perdido sensibilidad en el brazo, me dolía la espalda, no podía hacer nada, nada. Y es el que me detecta a principios de 2011 que lo que me pasa es que llevo la prótesis rota y que la silicona del cuerpo se ha extendido por todo el sistema linfático y lo que ha hecho es expulsarlo hacia, hacia los ganglios linfáticos. Entonces lo que tengo es un ganglio linfático que se ha hecho un siliconoma porque sabes que estás jugando, han jugado con tu vida a una ruleta, a una ruleta, ruta, una, una ruleta rusa. Perdona. O sea, es que te cambia la vida 100% a todos los, a todos los sentidos, a, todo, a todos los ámbitos. Es que aquí hay un problema muy grande. Aquí cuando te estafan en, en, en unas zapatillas que en vez de que son, son del mercadito, lo máximo que te puede pasar es que se te rompan, aunque tú hayas pagado una cosa que vale 100 meses más que la de un mercado. Pero es que aquí no es eso. Aquí me han estafado. Pagué por enfermarme. He tenido que volver a pagar para quitarme y tengo que volver a pagar si quiero que se haga justicia. Es tu cuerpo, es tu vida, es tu vida que deja de ser tu vida porque no te reconoces en lo mal que te sientes, en lo mal que te encuentras. Porque si la gente encima estuviera de nuestro lado, pues a lo mejor sanidad. Pero claro, como sabe que somos un colectivo muy pequeño, no, no cambian, esas normas no las cambian, ¿no? Sin nadie que se haga cargo de ti. Enferma y sola. Esa es la sensación de soledad. Um, Emilia had uh, PIP breast implants, and uh, as we heard many times today as well, but also everywhere from all parts, uh, the PIP case was a fraud, and no legislation would have uh, uh, helped to prevent it or avoid it. And while I don't think that uh, it's not just a coincidence that the PIP breast implants never reached uh, the U.S. market, I wanted you to listen to the story of Emilia just to stress that medical devices make heartbeats and allow people to walk, but if they don't work properly, they can disrupt people's life. And we have to bear this in mind, and I hope that decision maker will bear this in mind while uh, uh, revising the legislation. And I wanted to show you this video also to stress that we need to work all together to reduce stories like the one of Emilia and other stories that our members collected uh, in the last months. Emilia tells us that at present consumers are not adequately informed about medical devices and that when problems occur, there is no proper follow-up nor an adequate system to seek redress and compensation for the damages people suffer. And as Mr. Lise mentioned earlier this morning, in this respect the legislation is, uh, is still relatively weak. With a powerful example, the example of the shoes, Emilia reminds us that medical devices are not like any other product that you can just throw away that don't work and um, that they should be looked at from a wider health perspective. So we should look at medical devices beyond uh, the, the product itself, but also looking at the uh, human elements associated with it, being it the work of the healthcare professional, being it the patient to use a self-test device, an in vitro diagnostic device uh, at home. And that they, she show, she show us and she remind us that they should not be assessed in isolation, not only on the basis of their performance, but also on the basis of the actual benefit, the actual therapeutic benefit they, they can bring to, to patients. The European Commission proposal addressed many of our concerns in, with regard especially to the post-marketing surveillance. We're very happy with the, with the element that allow consumers to report uh, adverse event directly to the competent authorities because we, we, we know and we saw that it works for pharmaceuticals and we, it can work and bring uh, more safety also in the medical devices sector. We are also happy with the improved traceability system, with the, uh, with the database uh, for incidents, but uh, with also the improvement of UDAMED and um, with all the um, elements that improve cooperation uh, among member states. But of course there, are, there is also room for improvement, uh, and especially with regard to the pre-marketing assessment. Uh, I know this is the most, uh, uh, the most sensitive issue, um, but we have, from our perspective, we think that consumers 
don't understand and have difficulty in, in understanding why they are afforded a different level of protection depending on whether they take a pill for diabetes or they're implanted a device. All the more because if there is a problem with a medicine, you can just stop taking it, while if there is a problem with that implanted device, you need to go under a very risky surgery to have it removed. And there is this psychological element that needs to be addressed when we speak about the pre-marketing assessment, uh, also to restore trust uh, in the medical devices sector. And speaking about trust, I think that people out there expect, because of, of this unfortunate PIP case, but also the metal on metal heap and, the, and other stories that we heard, people expect more transparency and also higher ethical standard in the medical devices sector. To conclude, uh, Madam Chair, uh, I think that we need also to look more at the work of the notified bodies. Uh, Mr. Lisa mentioned a video that I'm sure that many of us have seen uh, released by the Daily Telegraph that show that uh, we need stricter criteria to ensure the competence and the independence of notified bodies. Another area where, where we think uh, we need better regulation is the area of um, borderline products. Now we have cranberry juice classified as a medical device. My mom bought cough syrup classified as a medical device. And if we continue like this, we will no longer have food or medicine, but we'll have only have medical devices. This is creating confusion for consumers. There are also inconsistency among member states because sim similar products are classified differently in different countries. So this area needs to be uh, better addressed. And we're confident that the, the European Parliament will further improve the European Commission proposal, putting people health first, and also guaranteeing that the consumers have timely access to uh, safe devices. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mrs. Passarani. Um, I will now um, move to our final speaker, Hans Heiner Juncker, who is here representing the European Association of Notified Bodies and he works for TUV Sud Product Service, one of the notified bodies in Germany. Thank you, Mr. Juncker. Thank you, first of all, for the invitation um, for this meeting here. Uh, I'm happy that uh, we are talk not talking about notified bodies, that we are also talking with notified bodies. Um, I think uh, notified bodies are playing a big part of this, and. Uh, um, it should be always the case that all the players are uh, part of this discussion, which is a discussion that will go on for a long time, I guess. This is not a discussion that will stop today. We will have a lot of, lot of discussions, points for the next uh, weeks and months to come. So my presentation, the, the topic of uh, the meeting today is, is a question. The question is, is the new legislation sufficient to protect patients? And the answer is, for me, it is yes. Click on. We welcome entirely the aim of the new proposal to make medical devices in Europe safer. And we support, in principle, the planned changes to the legislation. The following essential new arrangements are aligned with our reform proposals, what we prepared before. Um, we like the, the stronger focus on products during the conformity assessment procedures. Um, we need to focus more on products, less on quality system. Um, and this is something that we call hands on the product. Notified bodies need to have more focus on the product itself. We welcome also the introduction and establishment in law of obligatory unannounced inspections and also specified product sampling by notified bodies within the manufacturing process, knowing that this might be a result of the PIP case. But as it was mentioned several times, criminal companies, criminal people, you can never stop criminal people of trying to find a way around the law. Whatever you describe in the law, people will investigate, analyze the law to find a way to get around. So even the unannounced inspections may not be a 100% insurance that the PIP case will not happen again. We also welcome the legal basis for notified bodies to sample and test products that are already on the market. This goes also with 
with what we call hands-on products. Notified bodies should uh, and will have in the future more uh, a better relationship to the product itself. Next one. The added value of the new legislation um, for patients from our point of view is fast access to the new innovative products. I think we have to realize that in Europe, new technologies are faster available to the European patients, and this is a benefit of the system. And we should not throw this benefit away. New technology, especially in the medical device industry, this is an industry that is highly innovative. A lot of new techniques are born from this uh, industry. And we need to, to get these new technical possibilities to diagnose diseases earlier than with the old equipment. We need to have uh, a better therapeutic system in place to help people to overcome a disease. So the fast access to the new innovative products is one of the key elements of the system and we should stick to this and we should not get rid of this by implementing the PMA. Another added value of the system is the introduction of systematic product verification, as I said before. The product verification by notified bodies, maybe the product verification also by authorities is a very important part to make sure that only the safe and performing products are getting on the market and used by patients and users. Another added value is a string and control of products on the market. Market surveillance um, is, is, is a key element and the products that are on the market must be controlled. Uh, as a notified body, we are dealing with, not with many factors. We are dealing with the production life until it gets delivered by the manufacturer to the market. But we do see sometimes products coming from South America, and nobody knows exactly where this product is coming from. It comes with a CE mark on it. Uh, but nobody knows where it is coming from. So string and control of products that are on the market already will be a, and play a major role in this system. The added value of the new legislation is also the improve, is, is altogether the improvement of health and patient protection. When I read the new regulation for the first time, I said, oh God, 200 pages and more. Uh, I was used to dealing with the MDD and the AIMD for a long time, and I'm still looking into the MDD and to read again how it, to read this and interpretate this. And now we are dealing here with almost 100 articles and almost 15 uh, annexes. So this is a lot of stuff, and there's a lot of good stuff inside, but the discussion is, uh, I think, just started. In order to achieve a robust and sustainable assurance of safety and performance of medical devices, and this is what we propose, the proposal should contain further improvements, um, further reduction in freedom of interpretation. Reduction of interpretation for manufacturers, reduction of interpretation for the national authorities, and reduction of uh, interpretation for the notified bodies. This means that the arrangements for unannounced inspections, sampling and testing of devices on the market need to be made more specified and to be obligatory throughout. The whole message should be we need to have a clear, we need to have clear requirements. We need to have requirements that are not causing a lot of discussion uh, and is not causing a lot of different interpretation throughout Europe. We also think that enhancing close cooperation with notified bodies or between notified bodies and the market surveillance authorities is also crucial. As part of the system, the notified bodies must be part of the communication as well. Comprehensive integration of notified bodies into the information flow of the market surveillance authorities, in particular through suitable access to structured databases for coordinated recording and evaluation of Could medical I devices. I ask you to conclude your remarks so we have time for questions. Thank you.
Give me one minute. Yes, that's <laughs> An evaluation of medical devices that do not meet the requirements or are hazardous. Um, I have some more notes on this one, but the last page of my presentation is my conclusion, our conclusion. The new legislation is sufficient to protect patients with the remarks we made. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Juncker. Um, it's now the opportunity to ask questions to our panel of speakers. If you would like to ask a question, um, please, when you do so, uh, make sure that you give your name and explain which organization you are representing. Thank you. Mrs. McGuinness. Thank you, and thank you for this uh, event today. I shall be brief because time is short. Um, given that a number of notified bodies do most of the work, uh, it begs the question, are all notified bodies the same? The question is, are all notified bodies alike? No. Of course not. Do you, could you elaborate, please? <laughs> Notified bodies do have different scopes. They do different conformity assessments. Um, they uh, do have their uh, own system of qualifying the people, the experts. They are uh, supervised by national authority. Um, and that means we do have many different players in this situation and that allows a more a broader interpretation of the requirements. The more players we have uh, in all directions, the more and broader is the interpretation. Dr. Fraser, you have I was going to raise the same issue that has just been raised by uh, Ms. McGuinness from the floor, which is that with so many competent, with so many notified bodies, and with 20% um, uh, of them doing the vast majority of the assessments, I think it is an issue which isn't clarified in the recast proposals whether all um, notified bodies should be eligible to do all assessments. And if I take an extreme example from my own specialty of cardiology, if there is a new uh, fully implantable artificial heart that needs to be assessed, clearly it wouldn't be appropriate for every notified body to have to do that because they lack the expertise and the critical mass and the skills to do that. Um, and I'm sure we all agree about this, everyone here would agree, but the legislation doesn't prescribe how that can be achieved except through the supervision of the competent authorities when they approve the notified bodies. Whether that can be clarified usefully as part of this process, I think is something for discussion. The lady on the front. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have a question about the setting of the norms because uh, Dr. Fraser raised the issue that they are set not by the professionals, not by the physicians, that are industrial norms. And I'm wondering, uh, may, maybe Ms. Passarini, don't you think that when the norms are not formulated by the specialists, by the, by the physicians, or when, when, the, when the physicians are not uh, involved in the formulation of the norms, that when you have a system like this, uh, that is con con controlling if the product is conform the norm, and the norm is not maybe not medical enough, that it might be a risk uh, for the patients that there are products on the market that conform the norm, but when the norm is not medical enough, that there might be a lots of risk for patients. Well, the, the European Commission, the European Parliament and the Council are responsible for defining the norm uh, that uh, notified bodies, but also all the actors involved, uh, have to respect. Uh, the European Commission, in, pre in the preparation of this piece of legislation, consulted uh, the public, including all the stakeholders involved, so including medical doctors, and they are also represented here. So. 
system is working, not the direct, but when the system is working, when the norms are set, not the, when the, the setting of the norms, when it is not, sorry? The standards, sorry, the standards. When the standards are set by the, by, by the, by the, by the committees, and, and there are not enough physicians in the committees that setting the standards, then there might be, I guess, a risk that you can, you can check, you can, the, the notified body can do an assessment if the products are conform the standards. But when the standards are not medical enough, there might still be a risk, I guess, for the patients. Maybe maybe uh, uh, the, the doctors can not better answer to your question. Just want to say that w what you are the, the point that you're raising point out to the to the importance of ensuring that all those who make the assessment in the notified bodies have uh, full qualifications to make this assessment, as the example. Uh, um, mentioned earlier clearly show and of course we cannot have the same person assessing a, the, the safety of a toy and the safety of a um, heart valve for example that's obvious that's why we need clear legislation that require those who assess the product to have all the all the comp the company necessary competence but also work according to certain ethical standards because we saw that it's not always the case um, thank you for raising the question I, I don't want to imply that there are no clinical experts involved, but in fact they're involved at many different levels of the process. The notified bodies have their own independent experts who may be engineers, physicists, clinicians, advising them when they do their assessments. The national competent authorities have access to their own experts. And industry work with um, clinicians to develop new products and to test them. So it's a very close partnership at all levels. The difficulty arises that we have a European system, a single European market access through one process in one country, which is then generalized throughout the European Union. And we as professionals operate in a European level now, the European Society of Cardiology. Um, more than 70,000 cardiologists. We are operating in a European level, but this process is working with small groups in each country, and the, the two systems don't match, um, because we do this um, with a few experts in very specialized fields drawn throughout Europe, but they're not feeding into the European system at a European level and providing guidance for standards, which is what the system should be tested against. And if that can be clarified and coordinated better, that will be a very positive outcome from this recast. No, I just want to confirm, and thank you, Dr. Fraser, for saying this. Is, let's not get under the impression that uh, the medical field is not involved, even in setting up the norms. They are involved. Uh, so it's, and it's, as you said, and I agree, we need to make sure that we have the right balance of how this uh, system works. But <coughs> let's assure that uh, physicians and the medical uh, part is highly involved. Uh, any final questions? The lady there. Thank you very much. Florence Van de Velde from the Medicines in Europe Forum. I just wanted to speak in favor of pre-marketing approval. I have here a very short report from the Food and Drug Administration, 15 pages, and the title is very clear. Unsafe and ineffective devices approved in the EU that were not approved in the US. Um, it speaks uh, for itself. <laughs> uh, I think it's very important that we bear in mind patient safety is important. And there, has, uh, there, have, there have been other studies that show that for effective, uh, useful medical devices, there is no difference in delays between the United States and Europe. In Europe, we have more medical devices that are not able to be accepted in the United States because they are, they are not safe and they are not effective. I'd, uh, I'd enjoy to answer to that question. Um, <coughs> And indeed, we, we were aware of the studies that you're quoting. Uh, I, would, I would just like to make some comments. Uh, most of the products that were cited into that uh, study, uh, most of them are not medical devices and would not be classified under the world of uh, medical devices. Uh, and some of them were prior to 1995. Uh, now, let's, let's make sure that we also agree, and as we said, that the system can be improved and that we need to improve our system. Um, on the field of uh, whether or not the FDA system, because that's the one we're referring to, uh, is 
uh, equivalent to the one we have. Um, actually, there is many elements that de would demonstrate the reverse, because I can also quote you studies that demonstrate that on average, medical devices are available in Europe between three to five years prior to be available in the US. And that the US system, be it the FDA system, has not picked up better problems with devices than the European system has picked up. So uh, at the end of the day, when you, when you compare the two systems, uh, we don't see that the FDA system will bring further safety to patients, really, because it has not demonstrated so far to be able to do so. Okay, there is no elements that are proven that fact. Uh, but what we know, and if you compare over numerous uh, devices, we provide access to patients much faster. I would invite you to discuss this with also patient associations, uh, which we are working with you know, on a relatively constant basis, where some patients today have their lives saved with devices and technology which are available in Europe when they are not available yet in the United States. So that's all. So I, 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 I respect what you're saying, but I cannot let you say that's the only way to look at it. I would like to... And we can further discuss, obviously. Um, thank all the speakers uh, who have participated today, and uh, thank my colleague Corinne Lepage for inviting me to co-host this event. Um, as you may be aware, the Aldi Group took the decision to split the medical devices package, so um, Madame Lepage will take care of the medical devices regulation, and I will take care of the in vitro diagnostics uh, regulation. I'm looking forward to working with the rapporteur, Mr. Lisa, as well as other colleagues to ensure a certain amount of coherence in the, both parts of the package. I think what we have heard today from experts, um, from the Commission, from different stakeholders, it's quite clear that we all agree there that the new, um, the new proposed legislation will bring improvements to the system as it stands, um, but we may disagree on some aspects of that. Um, I think in particular we all agree on the importance of patient safety. Um, this is the number one priority for everyone. Um, the areas that need to be tightened up, which are indeed there already in the regulation, are to do with the way the notified bodies function and the way they are controlled by national authorities and increasing transparency, um, including information to uh, patients and clinicians, as Dr. Fraser mentioned, and also traceability. And another aspect which was um, touched only very slightly is that the legislation needs to be future-proof because technological developments mean that we now have devices today that we wouldn't have dreamt of 10 years ago. Um, so it's essential that both pieces of legislation allow for further technological advances. So thank you very much and have a nice afternoon.